Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm going to usher you into the new weekend. It is 4th of July weekend. I got plenty of events. It's also First Friday. Um, I got some news items. I got some new movies that are coming out this weekend, so let's kick things off. Um, Bill Cosby walks free after three a uh, three-year prison term, of which would have been the rest of his life. Bill Cosby, who retains his innocence, was able to get a deal struck by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision to vacate his sexual assault conviction. What basically started out as uh, a couple uh, things kind of being pushed under the rug from 2004, 2005, uh, got kind of a resurgence later on when uh, Hannibal Burris, I'll in, in a quote he said, um, he gets on TV, pull your pants up, black people. I was on TV in the 80s. I can talk down to you because I had a successful sitcom. Yeah, but you rape women, women, Bill Cosby, so turn that crazy down a couple notches. A quote by Hannibal Burris, which really sparked uh, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, public opinions and a lot of people to come forward in allegations against Bill Cosby. The joke reverberated with women to come forward about Cosby and even other black comedians have criticized Cosby from Richard Pryor to Eddie Murphy for her, his overbearing influence he brought from his past fame. Something that was basically an open secret in Hollywood prompted a massive Me Too movement which are also saw Harvey Weinstein get thrown into prison for five counts of rape. Um, Chasing Cosby is a great podcast that covers many allegations, and be aware that those stories are not safe for work. Uh, but the news cycle has seemed to overly dropped this story altogether, um, so we're going to just move on from there. Uh, so I'm assuming you heard about the condo collapse in Florida last week. Uh, thoughts and prayers to the families and friends of the those of the 55 units, the 13-story building. Um, as you already know, around uh, 1.30 a.m. Thursday morning, one of the condos towering in Surfside, Florida, collapsed, which had 12 stories and claimed uh, 18 confirmed victims, and there's still over 140 people still missing. And so far, right now, everyone's trying to figure out exactly why this happened, and a uh, 2018 report has surfaced, surfaced, surfaced uh, report of the structural integrity of the building that has been a source in many reports stating great concern of structural health with a major structural damage to the concrete slab below the pool deck it re recommends extensive repairs in the near future and it was a nine po uh, page report from october 2018 and some recent movement involving a multi-million dollar project would have started at some point but so far uh there are 145 people still under the rubble hoping that there are some still still people are still alive is all we can do right now. So the extreme heat, this extreme heat this week prompted me to check out Incineweb. So this uh, is a great website for those who want to keep updated on the current fires that are happening here in the United States. And here is a a map of it. So if you go to incineweb.gov. Uh, it's a great resource. You can zoom out. You can zoom in. You can see a lot of the fires in the United States, all the active fires and whatnot. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's looking pretty crazy out there for sure. Um, and we're going to see uh, the one fire that seems to be uh, one of the bigger ones here in the state of Montana, and which is, is currently at 65% containment. And this is the Robertson Daw fire. And if you click on the icon right there, you'll be able to go to the incident and find out a little bit more information about this fire as well. And it was updated information about 45 minutes ago. I did check on this about a couple days ago when I looked this up and it looks like the containment is still about 65%. There are two other fires uh, that are 5,000 acres a pop, which are about 95% contained, but currently Robertson Dawes uh, fire containment is at 65% and it's uh, just under 30,000 acres and it hasn't grown since then. So there's a lot of, uh, there's good containment going on there, but there's still a chance. You never know. Fire season's kind of upon us. Uh, we're having these intense heats, but I'm fairly optimistic because uh, the, the if we have a hotter heat and hotter uh, weather earlier in the summer, it, it has a better chance with some of the snow runoff. And uh, I mean, everything's still kind of green here in the Missoula Valley. So I'm a little more confident that there's not a fire. But um, if you've already heard in some of the news that there is uh, stage one restrictions on campfires. So if you're uh, back uh, country camping, they uh, ask that you do not have a campfire or a fire pit. Uh, for more information, you go to incineweb.gov. Uh, let's see. Let's see. 
Oh, yeah. So uh, th another big thing that's happening as well is that California has uh, decided to ban five more states in terms of official government state-wide travel, in terms of how uh, states, much like Montana among them, have uh, uh, treated LBGTQ communities by uh, outright banning trans athletes in um, sports. So what happened in California officials say at the state level will ban any state related travel to Montana and other states that have taken a stance against trans athletes. Most importantly, they've banned states that have shown any statewide le uh, le uh, le uh, legislation that discriminates against LGBT plus Q community. This isn't new. Since 2016, Texas, Alabama, Idaho, Oklahoma, Iowa, South Carolina, South Dakota, Kentucky, New, um, North Carolina, Kansas, Mississippi, Tennessee were among those states that uh, California has banned in terms. And this is all to do with like uh, government sponsored events, training, going to other states and travel. So they just outright banned it altogether. 17 states are now on the list, which include Montana, North Dakota, Florida, Arkansas, and West Virginia. Uh, 17 whole states being banned from California. The city of Missoula did speak on LGBT uh, uh, issues on Wednesday during a committee of the whole, and I have that report later on in the show. But I'm going to throw it over to a uh, interview that I did with the Missoula Food Bank in which they were talking about the free meals for anybody 18 and under for the summer meals program. So without further ado, here's this interview. And when I come back, we're going to have some pre-critic. Assuming it plays, just give it a time. Talk a little bit about the free lunches that you're providing for kids who are uh, 18 and uh, younger. Yeah. And uh, I was wandering through the library and I noticed what you guys started doing it here. So I invited you guys to talk a little bit more about it. So yeah. what is this program and how did it get started? Sure. So it has been around for quite a while, six years or so, more, seven years, eight years. Um, it's through a federally funded child nutrition program called the Summer Food Service Program. And so with partners like Missoula Public Library, Lolo School, Alberton School, um, we make available meals, so breakfast and lunch mostly, um, for anybody in the community to show up to different locations. And kids 18 and under can have a free meal um, and take them home. Nice. We also partner with some community um, summer camps like Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA um, flagship and provide some after school or afternoon uh, snacks as well. Yes. And so do you know a little bit of the history of this, of why this kind of uh, started? To meet the needs for nutrition for children in the summer. Um, many kids receive food through their school, so breakfast and lunch, and then go to an after school program where they might have an after school snack. Um, but when school ends, there's no, no food. Um, and so relying on, you know, what is available at home, which is stretched further, right? You have the same budget as you did in March as you do in July. And so that budget just gets stretched even further, trying to meet the nutritional needs of providing breakfasts and lunches. Um, and as we know, kids eat all the time. And so having the, the, the meals available just helps families and, and kids to be food secure. And this is not an summer. exclusive program for anybody who is a certain economic uh, status. It is for everybody. Sure, anybody. Um, mm -hmm. 18 and younger for those kids. Yep, anybody can show up to any of our open meal sites um, and grab a food. We have a spot at Missoula Food Bank as well in our Empower Place um, and just get any meal that, sh that is needed. Um, yeah. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about the Missoula Food Bank as sure. the building. It is a great resource for a lot of activities and a lot of uh, programs as well because I've done a cooking program on your second floor and you guys yeah. have a beautiful kitchen. Thank you. Uh, do you want to talk about some other programs that you guys do at the Missoula Food Bank? Sure. So like you said, we have our, our learning kitchen and conference room space, um, which is slowly making its way post-pandemic um, and being utilized more and more. We have yet to bring back our community-sponsored cooking programs, but um, Parks and Rec has been using the space, the Western Montana Mental Health Center has been using the space, the YMCA to offer programming for the kids that are in their summer camps. Um, we're hoping the fall that will pick back up. Um, our Empower Pack program is weekend bags of food. So on Fridays at our open meal sites, um, kids can also grab a, a backpack 
bag or a, an empower pack um, to take home and that kind of helps from from Friday to Monday just cover some nutritional needs over the weekend um, we just recently opened mm. our store back up so I'll let Caitlin talk a little bit about yeah. about that yeah so what are the hours at the store right now uh, we are open Monday through Friday, so Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday we have longer days where we're open till 7, so 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. People can sh come shop in our store, um, and then Wednesday and Friday just from 10 to 1. Um, yeah, and we never, we weren't ever closed during the pandemic, but we, we had a grab-and-go style where we had pre-made shopping carts full of food just to hand out quickly to make it so that people weren't in our store for a long period of time just to make sure social, right. social distancing was happening and all of that. Um, but yeah, last week, like Jamie said, we just reopened our store where people can either choose grab-and-go groceries like we had before, or people can shop just like a grocery store, um, grabbing whatever they need. We don't have limits on any of our food items. People just take what they need for their family, um, and people can come as often as they want. And similar to what you're talking about with the Kids Table program, there's no economic requirements or income requirements or anything. It's open for everyone at any point. Yep, and it's such a beautiful built, built building, yeah. like solar panels, right next to the uh, the only bowling alley in Missoula. And I say the only because I'm from Missoula. Yeah, so. <laughs> they've all been shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it is, a, like I said, it's a great, and they also have a lot of educational classes and programs as well. You were talking a little bit about Empower Place as well. So mm -hmm. do you, what, what is Empower Place? It's our kids area. Um, so it's a partnership between the UM Spectrum, Spectrum Discovery Area and Missoula Public Library and Missoula Food Bank and Community Center um, to fill the space full of enrichment activities and nutrition. Um, and it is open Monday through Friday from 10 to 1 in middle of July. We're looking at expanding our hours to, to meet, to match our store hours. And so we'll be open into the evenings of Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Nice. Um, we are currently operating with limited capacity just to, again, help with some social distancing um, as we are still navigating some, some COVID. Um, but kids can just come and play. There's a really fun ball wall and lots of you know STEM-based activities. Breakfast and lunch meals are available. Lots of books to read. I know the library is going to start Tiny Tales Ooh. back up. Um, in July and so looking at hours for for tiny tails and bringing that back to the food bank so slowly we're kind of returning to our what was there before um, and bringing all of our programming back yep. and part of the programming is that you also need volunteers yes. so you guys are looking for volunteers to uh, be part of the food bank family yes, yes definitely Do you want to talk a little bit more about how people can volunteer yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, throughout the pandemic, we really reduced our volunteerism. And as we've expanded all these programs again and reopened our store, um, we have a lot of volunteer jobs, whether it's packing ca uh, snacks for our kids program or um, helping in the store, stocking shelves or greeting our customers. Um, there's lots of, lots of different volunteer positions all throughout the day, and we have very flexible scheduling. Um, I'm the volunteer manager, and I work closely with someone named Marcus, who's the volunteer coordinator. So reaching out to either of us to volunteer um, the easiest way to get started is just filling out an application, which uh, you can find on our website at missoulafoodbank.org, um, or we have paper applications in our store as well. But yeah, filling out an application, and then we'll reach out and figure out a schedule. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so if you want more information, you go to missoulafoodbank.org, yep. or you can call them at... 406-549-0543. <laughs> Folks are just even looking for help connecting to additional resources in our community. We have resource assistance, we have SNAP application help, so lots, lots, lots there that we haven't even started talking about. So. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, guys, welcome back. It is time for uh, the uh, pre-critic. So this is where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but maybe the poster and maybe a little bit of the synopsis. Let's kick things off. Whoa. Uh, we got this next movie that's coming out. It is uh, kind of like a nice throwback to uh, simpler times when 
you would have your diaper changed. We welcome back those who we thought were done only to be reboot quilled with age defying powers that brings back the status quo characters as they have to stop a bigger evil only they can fix. We're talking about Boss Baby 2, folks, and from what I believe, this has to do with sibling rivalry and come to terms with family growing apart only to be reunited can achieve the car cathartic ending that we all crave and expect in this day and age. Uh, age, age tends to be a biggest draw in these films. Thinking babies have a secret society making us uh, hapless citizens are blissfully aware of deep state baby affairs. Up next, we got another movie, and it is, yes, the Purge movies. It's like, what if there was no laws? What if anarchy was allowed to come here? You remember the movies that allows people to commit crimes for one day a year? Well, they take that premise and just kind of be like, hey, the world's broken. Let's just uh, make this keep on going. This movie's called The Forever Purge. Coming out, and I assume the lawlessness of the West will influence this because, you know, hey, look at the poster. It's kind of a cowboy guy on a horse and stuff. Anyways. The West will influence this film in a way that gets people to band together at the last minute to defeat the bad people, or the worst people. Anyways, this is basically about a rogue group of people who like to take the law into their own hands and create a society of anarchy based on their lives stuck, and they want all our lives to suck too. Up next, we have Till Death. Oh look, it's Megan Fox. Okay, so she's like on ice and she's kind of laying there. So it's called Till Death. I'm assuming it's a thriller where she's going to kill maybe her husband since Till Death applies to the Till Death Do Us Part. Therefore, marriage, blah, blah, blah. So she probably has some kind of a good reason why she has to kill her husband rather than be like, hey, this guy kind of stinks. Um, I guess divorce is off the table. But anyways, we'll watch this movie about revenge kind of uh, – uh, movies or whatever, and I'm um, assuming she married some in, an irredeemable man who uh, needs to go, you need to go, but divorce is off the table, so here's the Ice Ice Baby. Up next, we got a new dub and stuff for you guys, and it tackles um, the 1944 movie Double Indemnity, and it's about a lady who gets a hapless guy to kill her, hu her husband. And uh, without further ado, here is the newest dub and stuff, and let's get this going. All right, one, two, <laughs> beat that. Oh, I will, my darling. And I'm gonna win at Chinese checkers. No, is this like what you guys do on normal, uh... Yes, we also hang out and have good times with each other. What's wrong with that? All I'm saying is that we... Yes, yes, let's listen to the man who's critiquing us about how we have... If you're fun. not going to add to the conversation, at least don't diminish it. I'm sorry I crowdsourced my insults. Well, I don't feel like you're crowdsourcing an insult to me. What do you mean by that? Uh, let me get up. What I'm trying to say is, you know, we like to stay home. We're homebodies. So what, you don't like to go to loud bars where we can barely hear each other? Huh, that's weird. Well, a good time is always Chinese checkers. Oh, yes. Please excuse me. Hmm, please go into the fart room. Oh, you're so forthcoming with that information. <laughs> Please excuse me. Well, the excuse me usually comes after. Just make sure I you know stay the in the room. I of crop dusting. I learned it from watching you. <laughs> Take that, old man. You don't need to tell me what to do. I know exactly what to do. I am your daughter, after all. Please excuse me. Oh, when are you going to mm. come back, honey? <laughs> the name is Honey. Honey Badger. Don't you forget that, okay? Hmm. Ah, oh, you badgers are something else. Well, she is gonna be a while, so I might as well sit with you, chap. Uh, so did you see any of the sports games? No, I just read about them. It was pretty exciting from That's what I've uh, seen response. in the news and stuff like that. Man, if only I could be there. Oh, we are in the off-season, my dear. There are no sports happening right now. Well, except the sports in our hearts. Where's yours? All right, so when you sign this, it's going to say that I was the life of this party, okay? Well, you are paying me. Oh, yeah, make sure you're in this little here. Mmm, very good. Yes, and the claws that I, uh, the toast, uh, give a great toast. Mmm, fine. I guess I could sign that, too. A one, a two, a skiddly doodly do. I'm signing, I'm signing the ding. All right. Well, thanks, Chief. I really appreciate this. This is going to make my social life expand even further than it is. Hmm, well, everyone's going to start somewhere. Oh, jeez. Now, how do I open this water thing? Hmm, you have to do the thing with the thing. All right, the bottle opener. Yeah, why'd you call it a thing? 
Uh, I think it's about time to get the Febreze for the fart. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for your city council. You want to know a little bit more what's happening with the, within the city council? There's definitely a lot happening, and we're kicking some things off with a updated process in which the city hopes to help forward and moving uh, in terms of uh, speeding up the process for developers and the permitting process. So we're kicking things off with uh, um, some election issues. So last week they uh, were kind of discussing about the upcoming election, how much it's going to cost. It's going to cost quite a bit of money. It's a six-figure uh, kind of deal. I mean, especially for like primaries when you have ballot boxes and stuff like that. And so last week I talked a little bit more about it. $119,000 for mail and 127000 for those drop-off boxes and polling places. And these are for the primary. And so uh, Sandra Vasica talks about the issues with the last election. This is what she had to say about that. Just where did I put it? Okay, here we go. In the last election, there were 10,712 ballots that were counted that were mailed to, set to citizens that had not voted since 2014. If you hadn't voted since 2014, that would normally make you an inactive voter. They should not have been mailed a ballot unless they specifically requested one, but they were, and those ballots were counted. That same election, 4,592 other ballots were counted were missing the affirmation envelopes. You know, those envelopes that say your vote will only be counted if that envelope is there and signed, those ones were counted anyways, even though the affirmation envelope was not there. Also, there was a nursing home, Hillside Manor, that had 28 affirmation envelope signatures that had the exact same handwriting. These revelations have ha not had any response nor any answer as to why they happened. So it would be foolish and frankly untruthful to say that there is no election security issues. It would be irresponsible and naive to be in favor of all mail-in voting for this election. Therefore, I cannot support this. I will be voting no, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. All right. So uh, basically, uh, soon after she made that response, uh, another pu public comment, she was worried that the mail-in ballot would, uh, would be a, an issue. But as the election and a lot of recounts have uh, confirmed, that there has been no issues with the mail-in voting system. So here is Stacy Anderson and uh, talks about, uh, brings up the fact that Missoula did a full mail-in election back in 2019 with no problem whatsoever. So here is San uh, Stacy Anderson from the city council. The 2019 municipal election was an all mail-in election, just like the 2020 election. All our municipal elections have been all mail-in for the past several years. And the voting fraud claims that you cited have been investigated numerous times and were found to not be um, credible. There has been numerous uh, election um, claims brought by and fully investigated by members of the legislature and have been investigated and by the Missoula County elections and have found to be that our elections were completely above board following the laws as put out and um, you know your election that you won by 11 votes 12 votes was an all mail in election and so the fact that that was so close even after a tally really shows that there is efficacy in all mail elections. All right, so uh, the next quote that I have for you guys is from, I spoke with folks on the election office just before the 2020 election, and one of the biggest things was the, uh, the issue of voter fraud. And one of the many cases in terms of this is that they said is um, that mail-in voting only came into question after the fact and that Montana was not one of those states. Um, hey, just think about it in terms of like, hey, Montana was a red state and they didn't have to do any kind of major recount. This is an example of a lot of national politics influence local levels and Montana, especially uh, Missoula has done everything to assure that the voters, their voice, uh, vo their vote was counted. When you move, the county, which is part of the Missoula elections, is notified when there is a change of residency, and thus updating the voting status. It would have to be a very small window if there were signs of voter fraud, and if they were, they were not counted, and a lot of times if there were any issues with the mail-in ballots, they would actually contact the uh, person, the voter, and uh, 
get the uh, confirmation for the voter from themselves. Um, Jesse Ramos didn't want the primary election for the fact that it would cost money to decide between two people running the same party, but in many ways the primary is important because the Montana's new state law requiring an election for the municipal court judges is up on the way, which originally was uh, for appointing uh, by the city council themselves. So Brian Valosberg speaks on, um, on this and the importance of voting um, and th the last election. I concur with some of my colleagues around co full confidence in our county elections administrator and staff and system. Um, and I find it, uh, and I'm not attributing this to Ms. Vasika to be clear, I find it repugnant that some other members in the state as well as across the country have cast doubt without any evidence on the system and then turn around and bemoan the lack of confidence in the system. They should be ashamed. All right, so that was Brian Von Lochsberg's uh, reaction to uh, election. Uh, fraud and tampering. The city voted up to held election for the primaries in the mail-in only for the primaries, and then the November election will be kind of a mixture between mail-in ballots and uh, the b basically polling places. If they were to add a, a, a in vo voting person person station, it would cop w upwards of a, an additional hundred and twenty thousand dollars on top of the original hundred twenty thousand. $20,000 needed for this election. Next up, we got Aaron Pian, the Office of Community Development and Innovation, talks about new plans in place to streamline the permitting process for development. So uh, kicking things off, we're having City Council Member Gwen Jones talk a little bit more about this. You can never please everyone. I know some people simply see this as, oh my goodness, a fee is going up. That's a bad thing. But when it's connected to a certain service level, that's the point of this. We wanna have faster service so that people can get these turned around and get building quicker because as we all know, Missoula is in a building boom and there's no end in sight at this point and we need places to live. This is a all right. A all right, so that was, uh, hold on, before I jumped over to, over to Jesse Ramos. So the recap from what I covered from last Friday, they want to have short-term and medium-term um, uh, housing development projects for the permitting project and going um, presented in front of the city which was originally about a six to eight a week process for the short term, which, you know, like townhouses, maybe four unit complex. And they want to make sure it scales back and it goes a lot more streamlined. And with the higher fees, they would be able to do it for between two to four weeks. So the city will have the ability to hire more staff to work with folks for, from the development community and present them to ki uh, to council for review much faster. Jesse Ramos thinks it's just another example of throwing money at a problem. And this is what he had to say. This is addre addressing a symptom of the disease that is not addressing the disease itself, which I think is overregulation, overcomplication, um, just an overall process that is designed, not intentionally, but is destined to take a lot longer. So I think until we address that root cause, there's no reason to further exasperate the problem by raising the fees, uh, which adds to the further cause of the disease itself, which is an overburdensome government when it comes to development. All right. So to kind of uh, go back on what Jesse was saying is that part of this is that the uh, city of Missoula, Aaron Pian, actually was working with developers in the city of Missoula. And also Jesse was concerned about the smaller developers who wouldn't be able to afford this process. But so far, this was a joint effort by the city and developers. This would alleviate Aaron's job a bit more for affordable housing advocacy. So far, this in-house policy and city council move forward on this updated fee for permitting. So up next, we got a series of committee meetings uh, happening, and we're kicking things off with uh, public safety and health. Uh, Chief uh, Jason White of the city, Missoula City Police talks about an updated report from the 2020 police report, which already has been published for uh, since uh, June of this year. So they have the whole update on crime reports and stuff like that. You guys can check out the whole meeting. But without further ado, I just wanted to talk, uh, just touch base on this during this meeting, and this is what... Uh, Jason White had to say. So in addition to there being more cases that our detectives work, and our detectives are primarily assigned to felony cases. So they are, they are focusing on the most uh, serious of crime, and we can see that they've had a 12% increase. But at the same time, like everyone else in 2020, uh, we were dealing with uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on our workforce. So you can see that we lost about 1,700 hours out of the detective division, which it basically amounts to about one full-time uh, FTE. 
So we lost the ability to have someone work and we had a 12% increase in cases. So needless to say, detective division is uh, very busy. And uh, I, I'm happy to say that uh, with the pandemic behind us that we shouldn't be losing those amount of hours uh, go, going into this year. All right. So that's, I mean, that's just a piece of what he's talking about. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, how there was also a 35% increase in aggravated assault and seven cases in homicide of 2020. Assaults are higher and in most cases stem from meth and opioids in terms of, of drug abuse and, op and overdoses resulting in death. Chief White also mentions that what needs to be done uh, to help curb this uh, problem. But this is not an effort and a situation that we can just simply enforce our way out of. This has to be something that the community as a whole addresses, not only from our perspective and our partners in law enforcement, but there also needs to be the ability for people who have substance use disorders to get the assistance that they need. And we are working in multiple arenas in a collaborative manner in order to help expand that capacity all right. So part of uh, a big trend in transitioning uh, uh, in terms of how uh, uh, crimes are being solved and um, dealt with um, is the fact that uh, now basically you can't be thrown into jail for a certain, I don't know, the, the, like it's the whole idea is like if you drink, you can't be thrown into jail for a public intoxication. A lot of times it's uh, it's also now like considered a mental illness for people who have a substance abuse to alcohol and part of that kind of uh, w interesting kind of restrictions and uh, allowances that the police are done to interpret the law and a lot of times uh, the police who have to deal with uh, drunk indecency usually has to do with uh, public disturbance kind of accounts. So those suffering from drug abuse have had a hard time getting any help and in many cases refusing help when presented uh, makes it harder to endure these trends. And like Chief White said, we cannot simply police our way out of dealing with some of these folks. Uh, most of the issues that stem from Missoula begins with drug abuse and in this presentation uh, helps uh, reflect that. And this is what uh, Chief White said. These are people that have non-violent felony uh, drug cases. So these are the folks that have the substance use disorders that have found themselves involved in the criminal justice system. And we work collaboratively to try to get people hooked into resources so they can deal with their addiction issue and get themselves back out of the judicial system. So th there are weekly meetings that, uh, that people from the Missoula Police Department attend in order to discuss each one of these cases. So it is a very high touch uh, program to that is designed to help people succeed in their addiction recovery. And with the a new the current trend that's happening um, in the United States in which uh, a lot of people are decriminalizing uh, drug use and trying to figure out programs that can help them as well. And, you know, the prime example of this is Oregon when they decided to decriminalize all drugs. And we're just going to see how they're going to handle a lot of this moving forward in terms of drug treatment and helping these and then helping these folks. Another. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Where am I going with this next? Uh, Oh yeah, so it, it just also, there's, there's a lot to this presentation, but uh, uh, on another note, traffic stops have been going down uh, like by 2,000 since 2018, from 10,000 to about 7,800. The police have most re uh, most of their resources that actually go to patrolling cars and their officers with four zones in which they updated uh, to have 12 zones, not necessarily more cops, but more areas in which they were patrolling and so far they will find out if this is needed or not. Uh, so this is a new thing because Chief White actually started to uh, get hired in the 2020 year. So. I don't think he's actually served a whole year within the city of Missoula. So uh, so for right now, it's a new uh, chief of police, and we're just trying to see about that. But so far, the pandemic has seen a major drop for 911 calls, and we've seen and, – and this is what we reported. And I gave you a, a taste, and please check out uh, this meeting in the Public Safety and Health meeting for updates on crime in the city of Missoula of, uh, of 2020. Up next, we got some public works, which looks to approve a pedestrian crossing in the northern part of the YMCA off Russell. And I only have one clip for this because it's pretty simple. And I'm just going to show you uh, uh, this uh, 
the screen which he shared and this is Monte uh, Sipe, construction project manager for the city of Missoula spoke on the reasoning behind this because uh, a pedestrian was was uh, hit by a vehicle in this area um, the uh, the businesses uh, in the area asked the city to um, look into a project a safety project that would help um, folks that were uh, looking to to access area businesses um, you know it's specifically opportunity resources um, to to have that uh, additional safety um, with the the crossing improvements consisting of ramps and, and center median all right, so Monte Sip goes on to talk a little bit more about this, but so far they wanted to have this connectivity around here. And down here is where you have your uh, YMCA, and up here is the fairgrounds and a couple parking lots. So they want to have this overall trail right here to have a connectivity just for uh, a Russell Crossing. There were some suggestions about roundabouts, but I'm pretty sure they're not going to do that. Um, but it's also, you know, Russell Street has um, been advocating for a slower uh uh, miles per hour uh, speed area because there is also CM uh, Russell School in that area, so they're trying to extend it a little bit further north. Uh, but also would be a good idea because you know the fair grounds are there and they're going to be doing the fair soon, so a lot of people will be using uh, a lot of the parking lots across from Russell to get to the other side. So that's kind of what's happening there, and as you showed, saw in the video, also the area leading to the fairgrounds would be included as the Missoula fairgrounds have greatly improved with new sidewalks, and connectivity is one of the major things moving forward. Up next, we got uh, the city approved this for the committee for the consent agenda and are pleased to continue the, the efforts to connect the trails in Missoula for bike ped. All right, so here's the thing. Uh, committee of the whole. And I was uh, kind of teasing this from the very beginning of the show, and this is LBGTQ plus rights in issues for the state level, and the city of Missoula is not having it, especially with uh, HB 112 and the other uh, bills that they tried to pass that would uh, greatly discriminate and uh, reject uh, trans athletes, but also uh, uh, with um, and which requires sex assigned at birth to, per to participate in the sport in which you were assigned that sex for. From what I've reported at MCPS school board, this law actually has a backdoor cl uh, clause in regards to federal funding. If federal funding decides to cut funding, they would uh, ultimately abandon this bill whatsoever. But uh, Gwen Jones reflects on the bills that were introduced uh, that would be anti-trans in the state of Montana, and it says that Missoula does not represent this kind of... Uh, uh, ideology from the state level. I was just shocked, first of all, that this was the priority. Um, and I was shocked that these bills were brought. I don't think they ever should have been brought. I don't think they ever should have been debated. And the school sports bill, which ultimately passed and was signed the governor by the governor, should not be our Montana law. All right, so that was uh, Gwen Jones uh, talked a little bit more about that. I also have uh, Jordan Hess who reflects on this, uh, uh, on these as well. And so this part of this is they want to create a resolution that they will send to the uh, the state of uh, Montana and be like, hey, this law is not right. It's discrimination, and we're not going to take this. So we're making a resolution saying that Missoula will support will support trans people and trans athletes in the future. I think that the city of Missoula has the opportunity to stand here today to plant a flag uh, that reaffirms that transgender youth in our community are welcome, they are valued, they are supported, um, and that um, this isn't uh, the Montana that we'd like to see here in Missoula. All right, so that was Jordan Hess, and up next we have a uh, public comment from a trans person uh, by the name of Zoe uh, Seffer uh, from Missoula. Uh, who went to the state capitol to advocate, and this is what uh, she had to say. As someone, as a woman who testified at the legislature about these anti-trans bills and who met with the governor's office to sort of plead for our humanity to be recognized and acknowledged, um, I can tell you that the laws that went forward were not only based on a misrepresentation of what it means to be trans, and not only did our pleas fall on deaf ears at the legislature, um, my community is suffering um, in response to the laws that passed, the laws that were discussed, and the laws that we know they talked about bringing forward. Um, I have um, friends who have left this state 
who were contributing members of our Missoula community who have left because they don't feel like there is a home for them here anymore. And uh, those of us who remain are scared about what the future for Montana, uh, what our future in Montana is going to be. All right. So that was Zoe talking uh, about her uh, experience being a trans woman. So far, the city has moved forward with a resolution and will hold a public hearing on this resolution between uh, July 12th through the 19th. And the point of this is to get public comment and to uh, make the final resolution to see what they can do to uh, fight this on the state level. So events are up next. And to kick off your 4th of July weekend, we have Jesse Rogers talking about Fourth at the Fort. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about some First Friday stuff. So stay with me and I'll be right back. Hi everybody, Scott here with Jesse Rogers from the Historic Museum at Fort Missoula. And you're here to talk a little bit about uh, the 4th of July and all the uh, activities that are taking place at the Fort location. Yes, so it's exciting. We had our hiatus last year and we're bringing back the 4th at the Fort celebration. This will be its 45th annual, been happening every year in Missoula except for last year and we're really excited to bring back this community tradition. And it is happening on the 4th at the Fort. Good thing we got the heat wave already taken care of for the week as we're transitioning into cooler weather because I did saw in the long range is that it's going to start dipping down, seeing lows into the 50s. That makes us happy because setting up for the event right now, we're all very hot. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to have some folks uh, doing some... Um, dress up and do some talk history talks and stuff like that so this year it is definitely a bit more low-key than our usual years just because we usually start planning in like january and this year we started planning about a month ago right because that's <laughs> when everyone's just like vaccine no more masks right we can do something yeah. let's go you can do something it's like oh now we have to plan to do something right and now you're at that point but you have always have a lot of great events um i know you've done lantern tours mm -hmm. through the uh and then that's usually in October, right? Uh, Lantern Tours is our holiday program in um, December, late November. We have our book sale in November, our fall harvest festival There's in so September. Much we have Forestry Day in uh, April. We have 4th of July, uh, the 4th of July, and then a multitude of other programs between. So it is exciting to get back to doing some of these community events, and it still will have a lot. So we do have hosted buildings, especially in the morning before it gets too hot. So uh, the event itself is from 10 to 4 p.m. Okay. And most all of our volunteers kind of went for the earlier show. So I would recommend everyone get there earlier, even though most things will be hosted in the afternoon. It might be a little bit more hit and miss. So we'll have hosted buildings, tours, old-fashioned kids' games and activities, crafts, uh, miniature pony rides, oh, Teeny Winks is coming back, so that's always fun. Um, the steam engine will be up and running, so the steam sawmill will be operational and out there cutting logs and making lumber. The Western Montana Antique Engine Society Association will be out with uh, their antique engines and hit-miss engines running around. The Western Montana Exploration and Mining Association wow. will be out doing sapphire mining a for the kids. A lot of stuff. That's crazy. Because I yeah. know that uh, a lot of train enthusiasts, you know, the Drummond um, mm -hmm. uh, train station, right? Yep, it's the Drummond Drum Depot. That's the place, if you love trains, is that's the place to go to because you can actually link up with some of the guys that are there yes. who work on a lot of those model trains. And the Model Railroad Club will be there, so they'll have the back end of the depot open, which has the really cool oh, yeah. mountainous, all the, I don't know how many types of train, model train sets they have, but it's pretty cool. So yeah, they'll be cool there. Stuff. Um, I know I'm forgetting a ton of There's stuff. There's so much going on. <laughs> it's, it's the 4th of the Fort, happening 10 a.m. to about 4 p.m. Yep. on the 4th of July. Yep, and it's a July. good way to kind of kick things off because 4th of July is always about nighttime and blowing stuff up and, well, you know, fireworks and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to keep the blowing stuff up at a minimum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is coming from my old, my old oh. days. Oh, yeah. The, the old sky back way in the day. But yeah, there's always a bunch of things happening in Missoula, and uh, Fort Missoula is a great place to check it out. Yep, and it will have our Pepsi booth there. DraftWorks Brewing has donated us a bunch of great brews. So there'll be cold drinks, food trucks. Um, the few things we won't have for sure this year, but we'll bring back in 2022, is the live music, the big tent. So we recommend people bring your own shade or something like that so you can keep cool. We'll have some misters going. And... Uh, 
New this year is we are partnering with the Missoula County Health Department to have a COVID vaccine clinic out there. So if you have any questions or want to know more about the vaccination for COVID or just want to get yep. one while you're out, you, can, you can get a brew and then get a vaccine. Yeah. See? And you can hear from the experts themselves um, administering the vaccine. Exactly. So, it's a yeah. great time to get your questions asked. Honestly, this, is, this kind of event definitely helps reaffirm that Fort Missoula, Historic Museum Fort Missoula, is open for business. Go check it out. Yep. Iris Garden. Oh, don't miss the Iris Garden. Yep. The blooms over the past couple weeks have been gorgeous. Yep. I was out taking photos. Um, finally, also this year, it is free admission. So we knew this last year was kind of rough on our neighbors and friends, so we wanted to make sure there was no barriers to come and enjoy your community museum. So we are putting up some donation uh, access, so if people want to come in and give us a donation to help support this great event, We'd love it, but it is a no admission fee this year, and we just want to welcome the community back to their museum and come out and have a hoot. Yep. And if you miss this event, they have plenty of other events that are upcoming as well. Um, you can get a hold of them by calling them at their number and going to their email address. So we're going to pop that up for you guys right now, and if you want to tell them where people can find more information. We keep our Facebook really updated, so definitely check out our Facebook and Instagram, Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. Also, our website at www.fortmissoulamuseum.org, and you can find out all of our contact information there. Also, just Google us and give us a shout. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for some fun uh, First Friday stuff. If you guys are planning on going out, Checking out some of the art museums. Missouri Art Museum is a always a great uh, place to go. Free admission, free admission, free expression. They always have a new uh, uh, gallery opening every month, uh, and they're going to be having some great stuff there. But we're going to talk about some of the other uh, galleries and other things here in town, and we're kicking off with the uh, uh, Gallery 709 inside the uh, Montana Art and Framing. And we're kicking things off what's called Salt Mine Artist Group. Uh, the 10th anniversary exhi exhibition of Salt Mine Contemporary Artist Group, Still Afloat, is a group of artwork mostly created for this past year during the pandemic. Ble Bev Glukert, Stephen Glukert, Peter Kiefer, uh, Caitlin M Mallory are amongst the many artists that will be featured that night as well. Uh, most fir first Friday events start at 5 and they go until about 8 or 9, so you guys can check that out. And of course, uh, the galleries are usually open during regular hours uh, during the month, and you have to go online to check that out as well. Up next, we got from the artist shop, uh, Sculpted Rockers, and this is going to be at the artist shop, uh, challenging the comfortable chair uh, pair. Uh, ugh, I probably should have practiced, but Drew made some. Uh, Drew makes Sam Maloaf and Hal T uh, Taylor inspired sculptured rocking chairs sized to fit their owner. And so these are uh, paintings of chairs. And so that's what the inspiration behind this was. And that's going to be at the artist shop. Uh, up next, we got Body of Earth Art Show. This is going to be at Suite 306. Uh, this is just uh, at 126 North Avenue, Suite 306. Third floor of the same building as the artist shop is located in for one time showing of Body of Earth's art show by uh, presenting or original artworks in the medium of watercolor and pen and ink capturing the relationship between nature, natural environment and the feminine form. Yeah, so that's what's happening there. And then we have our last one. Uh, they're getting more and more, uh, but I usually go for the uh, events that have a nice poster. And this is a first Friday uh, Mend Missoula. Starting uh, from 5 to 11, Min, uh, Mind, uh, Montana, sorry, excuse me, Mind, Montana, uh, uh, physiotherapy and enjoy the works of two local artists. They are excited to feature Ariana Newton and uh, Adele Willoughby, Willoughby, both multimedia artists and University of Montana alumni. So you, can, you guys can check that out and more. But I have an ad for you guys that I'm going to be running, but it is going to be a short one, and it will be a nice transition and to remind you guys that we're having a uh, celebration on the 14th of July here in the Missoula Public Library. So without further ado, here is this video. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited. We would love to see you. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited. You're invited. Please come join us for the grand opening of the new wonderful Missoula Public Library on July 14th. You're invited.
doesn't just warm your hearts. Let's continue and talk about some more events that are happening this weekend as well. If you are planning on doing some things, just so you guys know, as the food bank already mentioned in my interview, is that the kids eat free. If you're 18 and younger, you guys get a free lunch here at the public library and many other locations around town, including the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. Uh, let's see. It uh, looks like there's also another one happening at uh, Sisson University Apartments, Silvertip and Creekside Apartments, Travois Village, uh, Futura Mobile Home Park. Uh, breakfast and lunch is happening uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., Wednesday, Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Breakfast and lunch Monday, Tuesday, Thursday from 2 to 7. And, of course, the library is having their lunches Monday through Friday, 11 to about 1 you might have to double check with us, but that's that's the rough estimate that I've been given. Uh, story time, Missoula Public Library. Uh, story time is for children's age three and older and their caregivers. Join us for stories and fun in the level two programming room in the new library. Story time will be recorded and posted online later. Dates at the on the library's official website, YouTube channel. And so, if you guys missed it, you guys can always watch it online. And MCAT produces it as well. Hands on science. Spectrum Discovery Center is doing some science activities, discovery events from 2 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday. This week is the Maker Madness. Spectrum Discovery is open for visitors of all ages to explore science through engaging ex exhibits and activities. Wizard, uh, the Wiz of the West. So, Missoula Children's Theater is putting on an original show uh, with their kids from uh, the Missoula Children's Theater camp. And the Missoula Children's Theater presents Wiz of the West, a classic story of Wizard of Oz, but with a twist, or we say, should we say a twister. Uh, there's also a 6 p.m. show and a 4 p.m. show happening tonight. You can check that out uh, by going on to mctinc.org. Uh, art, blood pressure checks, and CPR competition. Fight or flight emergency medical educators. Uh, starting at 5 p.m. Stop by to view some art. Get your blood pressure check. Test your CPR skills. Best score of the night wins a free T-shirt and enjoy some beverages and snacks. They are located at 210 North Higgins Avenue. Enter th the door through Doc Sandwich Shop and Mood Boutique. Go past the elevator, down the stairs, and follow the signs to a classroom at the end of the hall to the left. Um, and that's what's happening there. So CPR challenge. But then we have uh, Kettle House Amphitheater, Brandy Carlil, Carla, Carlisle, uh, will be performing at Kettle House Amphitheater tonight, Saturday night, Sunday night, which I think, I don't know how many people are actually going to go to see this Sunday night performance. But anyways, Kettle House Amphitheater, summer concert series, but that's not uh, due to high demand. She's at a second show for Saturday, July 3rd, but I did see something for Sunday f at the Kettle House, but... I'm just going to ignore that and just say that they're going to have two nights there so far. Drum Brothers Outdoor Benefit Concert. If you don't know who the Drum Brothers are, they are a pretty much been drumming around the city of Missoula for more than 30 years, and they're the ones that uh, kicked off the first night uh, celebration for uh, um, New Year's Eve. And yeah, they're uh, they're doing a thing at Second Chance, uh, and that from uh, starting at 7:30 p.m. tonight, Drum Brothers will be performing a special outdoor concert to benefit the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center and celebrate the retirement of Betsy Mulligan Day, the executive director of the uh, Jeanette Rankin Peace Center for the last 17 years, and she's been on many of the MCAT shows, and we've done many things for the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center. Uh, attendees are encouraged to bring their own seating and refreshment. The Copper Cliff Cafe mobile food trailer will be on site from 6 to 8 p.m. to provide tasty food, and the suggested donation for the concert is $15 to $25 per person. If you're interested in doing some things on Saturday, Markets and more. Uh, all your fun markets are happening from about 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. Uh, best time to come is between probably 9 and 12, but those are the times in which you guys can check out some f uh, produce, um, a bunch of food cars and food trucks, not even trucks, a lot of tents that pop up. They have a lot of, uh, they have boba tea now. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of things that are happening there, not to mention the People's Market has started, which is off Pine Street. They got the uh, market that's underneath the uh, Higgins Bridge, which is in current construction, and then by the Red X's is, is the t the old school farmers market that has always been there. All right, so Moon Randolph Homestead, like always, uh, they have tours from 11 to 5 p.m. You learn about homesteading and one of Missoula's preserved homesteading properties, Moon Randolph. Or Moon Randolph. Um, also, MCAT trainings and more happen every Saturday at 10 a.m., and it is a wonderful resource for people to get involved. Live music with Sundog North, the Cranky Sam Public House. Uh, they're going to do some outdoor uh, performances depending upon the weather and all that stuff. So, of course, Sunday is 4th of July, duh, and uh, Old Fashioned Fourth at the Fort Celebration Historic Museum for Missoula. They have a lot of stuff happening there, as you heard from the interview with Jesse Rogers. But to reiterate, it is a fun 
uh, activity based stuff from 10 a.m. to about 4 p.m. Just some good day activities for the family. Family Funk Fest 2021, Funk the Pandemic. Silver Park Pavilion is also doing a performance Sunday afternoon starting at 2 p.m. Fruit trucks, yard games, and full bar by VFW. Uh, best of all, entry is free, uh, although all the stuff that you have to buy to ingest. Um, <laughs> Fourth Fest, Fourth of July fireworks. Southgate Marl is going to do their Fourth of July celebration from 6 to 11 p.m. And I have spoke with the Missoula City Band. They will not be performing at the Fourth of July celebration uh, this year uh, like they've done in the last, God, so many years. So that's kind of what's happening here in the city of Missoula. I am pretty much done with my morning show. Yeah, I've had a long show for you guys. I do want to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And then as always, you can find me by Googling Wake Up Missoula. You can find me on YouTube, Facebook, and all that stuff. So without further ado, I hope you guys have a wonderful 4th of July weekend. It's going to be uh, pretty crazy out there, folks. <laughs> I have nothing more to say. Goodbye.